Greetings and welcome to the latest event in the Geese College of Business Global Challenges in Business webinar series. I'm Amanda Brantner, Senior Associate Director in Online Programs here at the University of Illinois Geese College of Business, and I look forward to spending the next hour with you. Our faculty experts at Geese have developed this series of webinars to address the business implications of coronavirus and, and enable you to be better prepared for all the challenges it presents. We hope that today you'll gain some knowledge and strategies to not only weather this storm, but succeed through it. Before we get started with good faith and forward looking, how do CEOs and CFOs talk about the impact of the coronavirus shutdown on corporate profits by Professor Faye Dew? I want to cover a few housekeeping items related to the Q&A portion of today's session. Please submit all of your questions via the Zoom Q&A feature. Your questions will be submitted publicly for the whole audience to see. In order to develop consensus around questions, please use upvoting. The upvote thumb is located next to the question in the Q&A window. You can only upvote once, but you can reverse your vote. We will bring the top questions to Professor Dew following the presentation. Any general housekeeping questions will be answered in text by the GEESE team working in the background. Questions submitted via chat will not be taken. I look forward to moderating the Q&A a bit later in today's session. In the meantime, I'll turn things over to my colleague, Rob Towner, to introduce today's presenter. Thank you, Amanda. My name is Rob Towner, and I am Director of Business Development with Online Programs. It is my privilege today to introduce today's presenter, Faye Du. Faye is part of the accountant faculty here at Geese, which are ranked number one in the nation in the BYU faculty research rankings. She earned her PhD in accounting from the University of Southern California in 2011 and joined Geese in 2017. One of the first things she did when she joined the college was develop a new graduate course, Data Analytics in Managerial Accounting. This course recreates real world challenges that managers face and teaches them how to use data analytics to solve them. She is a leading expert in managerial accounting and how companies can use their own data to impact performance. Please join me in welcoming Professor Fei Du. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very much looking forward to the next hour where we can discuss some interesting questions about the CEO and CFO disclosure strategy. Um, I know that um, the most precious gift that we can give each other is our time and our undivided attention. So without further delay, let me just go ahead and get started. So the topic I'm going to introduce today is called um, how CEOs and CFO talk about the um, impact of coronavirus on the corporate profits. So what I plan to do is, first of all, let me briefly talk about why you might be interested in attending today's session. Okay. Great. So um, I'm super amazed by how many participants are joining this Zoom session. It's definitely very different from my usual teaching session where I see 30 to 50 to 100 students. I'm very grateful that this Zoom session is not bounded by the geographic boundary. And I look forward to this inti uh, intellectual exchange with you all, no matter where you are in the world and no matter what kind of time zone you're in. So why are you interested in attending this seminar? Maybe you want to understand the change after the pandemic, and you want to learn more about the perspectives of CEOs and CFOs of the largest companies in the United States, right? Or it's also possible that you yourself is a high-level executive or you're a manager, and you are also called on to talk about the impact of corona, uh, coronavirus on your own organization. So maybe you're interested in learning what kind of strategy can we learn from these CEOs and CFOs of the largest companies? In addition to that, maybe you're interested in the technique, in how to do the textual analysis, and maybe apply to your company's transcripts 
for example, a sales pitch or a meeting minutes, just to see what is going on with these meeting minutes and how do we analyze the text there. So one quick heads up is that data analytics, not just about numbers these days, texts, images, videos, network data are all very good data. Okay, so before I start, I plan to first talk about the method I'm going to use for today's session. So what is the sample that I use and how do I select these companies? Now, I'm going to talk about uh, 29 companies, most current quarters earnings conference called transcripts. So that is my full sample. I'm going to make a comparison between the pre-coronavirus quarter and the post-coronavirus uh, post quarter. So I'm going to make a pre-post comparison to see what is the impact of coronavirus on the CEO and the CFO strategy. Now, what you're seeing now is a string of all the company names that I'm going to use. Now, in addition to that, you can probably see some of the companies are highlighted in blue. And these are the companies that I take an even closer look by reading their disclosure transcripts line by line and give you some specific examples in what are these people saying during their earnings conference calls. This season is not um, the most pleasant earnings seasons that we see. Now, uh, based on a recent Wall Street Journal, we see that um, in the first quarter in 2020, uh, when people are giving the earnings growth forecast, um, there is big drop and there is big shrinkage there. Um, and in addition to that, there is great uncertainty. We do not know exactly what will happen in the next quarter or in the next few quarters. So there is great uncertainty there. Now, during this uncertainty period, it's no wonder that everyone is interested to know the transparent and truthful disclosure of companies of how exactly their profits are going to be affected by the coronavirus. So that's why SEC chairman urges companies to truthfully disclose the impact of coronavirus as specific, as detailed as possible. When the SEC chairman talks about these companies need to make a truthful disclosure. What exactly is he expecting? He's expecting all these companies in the forthcoming earnings call to make a transparent disclosure of the impact of the coronavirus, right? So when to expect the earnings calls? The earnings calls usually happen right after the earnings call announcement and the earnings release. So that's when earnings call happen. It happens after the earnings release and before the company um, formally discloses the quarterly report. So based on the sample, what we can see that every company is supposed to disclose their earnings call transcript to the public within 35 days after the quarter ends. Now, after we know the timeline of the earnings conference call, what is exactly a conference call? What to expect during these calls? Now, these earnings conference calls, they include two parts. So every, earnings com com uh, every company's earnings conference call would follow the same format, the same structure. So the two parts, which I'm also going to discuss separately in today's webinar, is the first part is called prepared remarks. So during the prepared remarks, the IR, the investor relations director, is going to say a welcome message and giving today's agenda. Following that, CEO is going to talk about the financial overview, starting with the product, followed with different segmentation, different sessions, different product lines. So that's CEO's financial overview. After that, usually a company would um, designate the chief financial officer, the CFO, so to talk about the financial details. There, the CFO talks about the uh, top line, like sales, and also talk about the cost of goods sold, the OPEC, the operating expenditure, and then talk about the gross margin. So that is the prepared remarks. It is uninterrupted presentation by the CEO and the CFO based on a prepared transcript. After the CEO and the CFO finish this part, the investor relations director is going to signal that the Q&A session begins. So during the Q&A session, 
um, there will be usually a dozen of analysts covering this industry, being familiar with the company, joining um, pre-coronavirus, it will be in person in a conference room. And during this period, most of the time is in a Zoom session. They will ask their questions and CEOs and CFOs, they will either take turns or they will jointly answer these questions. Okay, so what is an earnings conference call? It has two parts, the prepared remarks and the Q&A session. So if we do want to take a look and see what is the CEO and CFO's disclosure strategy, let's begin to look at some very basic numbers. So the first the basic numbers that I'm going to talk about is how many words are there exactly during the current quarter. By current quarter, I mean the most recent quarter, which is the quarter that is most severely impacted by the coronavirus. And how many words are there during the previous quarter? And if you may make a conjecture there, is this getting shorter or getting longer? So let's take a look. Now, during the current quarter, um, the number, the average number of words for the 29 largest companies in tech, in consumer staples, and in healthcare, it's 10,468. During the previous quarter, that is the previous quarter right before the coronavirus um, kicks in its impact, the average number of words is 9,779. So if you do a quick calculation there, we, uh, we think it's intuitive to understand that the length of the text increases and increases roughly by 7%. It's not a really big jump, but still you may make some interpretation there. Now, assuming that these people are still keeping the same speed when they are talking, then the duration of the conference calls, that is how many minutes these conference calls last, would be very in a ma very matching pattern with um, the length of the characters and the length of the words that's being used. So as we can see here, um, across the three sectors, including the tech sector, the consumer sector, and the healthcare sector, we see that across the board, there is a consistent increase, although the increase is not too much. So we can almost think that the duration and the length of characters do not see a significant increase in the coronavirus quarter. However, the more interesting and more nuanced um, understanding of the disclosure strategy lies in three parts. So if we call a disclosure strategy of how the company plans to convey the message to um, the analysts and to everyone, to mutual fund managers, to investors, to everyone, to the public who is attending this um, earnings conference call, there are three parts, right? So content is what they say, what exactly they say. Is it about profit or it's about product or it's about technology? And in addition to that, People also care about the tone when CEOs and CFOs deliver this message. And they also care about the style when they deliver such a message. And what exactly do I mean by tone and style? You can understand this intuitively as how this message, how this content is disclosed. But as we move forward in this presentation, you will see more clearly what I mean by analyzing the tone and the style of um, people's transcript can give us a better understanding of the disclosure strategy. Okay, so as I mentioned um, earlier, I'm going to firstly talk about um, the CEO and CFO's disclosure strategy in the prepared remarks. So if you recall, I talked about there are two parts of the earnings conference call. One part is the prepared remark and the other part is Q&A session. So I'm going to talk about these two parts separately. The topic for today is what is the impact of coronavirus on the businesses? It's definitely not a very pleasant news to talk about. And in, um, when I read and when I go through these conference, uh, these conference call transcript and see people's disclosure, um, I can see people's struggles, right? I can see people are working across the clock to deliver uh, the products to the consumers and try to make sure that the supply chain is functioning well. So I'm here in this slide, I'm giving some trivia that I got from the impact of coronavirus um, 19 on the business. For example, John Moeller, who is the COO and the CFO of Procter & Gamble, 
um, when he was asked by the analyst, why is uh, grooming products not doing good? So he says that the challenge there is the lower shave frequency while working from home, to put it bluntly. So you can see that this is a quote that describes the change of the coronavirus 19 on the customer demand. So you would expect that this would affect the top line number, which is the sales revenue number for a specific product. The second example that I'm giving here is from a CEO of Coca-Cola. So James Quincy, when talked about how the uh, Olympics in Japan is going to be pushed out to next year. So he talked about not only does consumers demand is going to be affected, but there are a lot of things already lined up previous to this event. For example, fixed insets in the assets and in the sponsorship, there's a lot of fixed spending that's already there. So that would be another impact on the businesses. So these are just some, um, these are some, um, quotes, detailed quotes to give you some flavor, but if you take a look at the general impact of the COVID-19 on the profit, then briefly I can use a framework based in accounting to talk about how coronavirus can, uh, can um, affect every aspect of the business. So let me start with the top line, right? So the coronavirus may affect the sales in a way that it affects the company's pricing strategy, how the price is determined. It may also affect a company's sales mix. That is, uh, to what extent are customers going to go toward the lower end and the more economical product? Coronavirus surely affect the store traffic, the number of sub subscriptions. So, to that extent, we can say that coronavirus may affect the top line number by affecting the customer's demand. Now, in addition to that, if we move to the next column, if we move to the next row, here we see that coronavirus may also affect the company's cost of goods sold. Now here we're talking about for manufacturing firms, their production, their supply chain, their inventory process, the suppliers may be affected, the regulatory environment may also change, and when your sales number is affected and your cost of goods number is affected, it's not surprising that you will see a difference in the gross margin. Now move down another row, we will see that the operating expenses, for example, the spending on the sales expense, on advertisement, general administrative fee, R&D, these may all be affected, right? So Coronavirus affects the sales, the COGS, and the OPEX. So it's definitely not an easy job for the CEOs and CFOs to talk about the impact. And let's see that, do people care about uh, mentioning the coronavirus-related words in the conference calls? So here I give a brief comparison of across three sectors for technology, for consumer, and then for healthcare. From last quarter to current quarter, what is the increase in the number of mentioning of coronavirus-19 in the earnings conference calls? So you can see that in the current quarter, on average for technology sector, people mention coronavirus, social distance, um, health, uh, he um, health prices, the virus 20 times on average. For consumer stable um, section, 32 times. For healthcare, 52.6 times. So that is the frequency of COVID-19. But more importantly, let's take a look at what are the specific words that are mentioned uh, when people talk about the coronavirus um, in the current earnings quarter. So if you still recall, in the beginning of the presentation, I talk about the number of the total words and also the length of the total words are almost the same for these two quarters, right? So when you see this, you can also see here, I include two graph and the graph that's on the left-hand side shows the increase of the negative words for the three sectors, that's tech, uh, technology sector, consumer sector, and healthcare sec sector. So if I do a simple word count of the negative words, right, you can see that the increase of the use of the negative words is very consistent, noticeable, and significant across the board for these three sectors. Now, what is even more interesting, now what is even more interesting is on your right-hand side, 
when you're seeing this slide, you can see the word frequency count of the positive words. So here we can see that um, in the current quarter, which is shown in the blue bar for technology sector, consumer sector, and healthcare se sector, for all three sectors, the use of the positive words also increases. Why exactly is this happening? Why is it exactly is this happening? Okay, we'll talk more about that. So for everything that we will talk about, um, if it comes to the impact of the coronavirus, there are definitely two framings of everything. You can talk about in a negative framing and you can also talk about it in a positive framing. So a lot of times we see that CEOs and CFOs would use the wordings like, I feel very good about the underlying trajectory. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the gross margins mechanism. And based on the uh, disclosure strategy that we see in the CEO and CFO's disclosure strategy, we see that they definitely, um, they definitely move toward the positive framing more during the quarter for the coronavirus. People will say that they keep good faith that science will win this battle against coronavirus. People will say that um, they have positive confidence that this effect is um, transitory and after a few quarters, things will be back to normal. So let's take a look at the negative and positive framing. What exactly do I mean by that? I just list several words and by looking at these different columns, you can definitely have a feeling that sometimes we can use different framing of words to describe exactly the same thing. For example, courageous, confident, and complacent. You can definitely see that courageous is more positive framing, while complacent is more negative framing. And it wouldn't be surprising that the CEOs and CFOs use this strategy to be more uh, positive framing when they're talking about the impact of coronavirus. The next, um, in, uh, the next insight and empirical pattern that I want to share is, let's take a look and see what is the number of the uncertainty words and the certainty words that are used in previous quarter and in the current quarter. Again, in these two graphs, the left hand side shows the use of uncertainty words. And the, left, uh, the right hand side shows you the pattern for the use of the certainty words. As usual, during this presentation, the yellow bar represents the last quarter and the blue bar represents the current quarter. So we can see that across the board for all three sectors, there is a significant increase in the use of uncertainty words. And there is also a drop in the use of certainty words. Again, I would say that this is pretty intuitive and this would confirm our priors. What would be the ways to describe uncertainty, right? There are different ways to describe uncertainty. People can just say approximately, probably, or maybe. Now, in addition to that, what we see in the disclosure strategy of these CEOs and CFOs is to definitely try to give a promotion focus or a positive framing when they are describing uncertainty, right? So, um, for example, the second quote that you can see here, well, there is a prohibition on any transport people across the state lines. This definitely caused some disruption in the supply chain and caused some disruption in the labor market, in training people, but they would give more details in this specific situation and say that this is just an example of the level of operational agility that we are having to execute. So again, giving it a positive framing. Now, with that being said, what we have looked at is the length of the words and the duration time and also the use of positive words, negative words, certainty words, and certainty words. So this is just a, a brief view. If we want to take a look at a specific disclosure strategy. Now, a typical opening in the previous quarters before the coronavirus kick in, right? What do people talk about? in the opening paragraphs. Paragraph one, usually we have a solid quarter. We are very proud of the operational results. Paragraph two, the CEO is going to talk about consumer demand, the growth, the new technology, 
um, the growth by product, by region, by segment. This is intuitive. And in paragraph three, the CEO will, uh, the CFO, the chief financial officer is going to talk about the top line number, the spending, the um, cost, the uh, operating expenses, and talk about the gross margin. So you can see that this is a typical structure in the previous quarter, but things are very different in the current quarter. Now in the current quarter, a typical opening in the current quarter is, um, this is a very challenging moment and we are very, very grateful. People will focus on saying our privilege to help people at this moment. And technologies like this and that are being used to help fight the disease head on. Or sometimes people will say, the health and safety of the men and women we work with, our colleagues, associates, our community, and we work with the government. So a very sharp difference and a pattern that we notice is that people show more gratitude during this very difficult quarter. It was really hard to find people, especially CEOs and CEOs, thanking people and showing appreciation for their associates during the previous quarter, but in current quarter across the board, everyone is showing gratitude. In paragraph three, although there is uncertainty, most people say that this is an opportunity to learn and observe. We will emerge even stronger and we remain confident about the future, right? So this time it is more about people. There are two ways to talk about the changes and the new demands after COVID-19. Right. So what I'm listing here, it would be the most intuitive way to discuss how the crisis have affected customer demand. Uh, it brings some headwind for the store traffic, for the inventory management, for the supply chain. It may also affect the internal processes negatively and the supporting cost, for example, increase the cleaning cost and also the cost for testing. Now, what we notice in current quarters disclosure strategy is people don't just rely on this type of passive tone. Most time what we see is CEOs and CFOs will proactively saying that our products and service help customers meet urgent need during the crisis period. And here is how we actively respond to the crisis and our business processes are flexible enough to quickly adapt to the new way of working. A very interesting trend that I noticed, especially for technology sector, is in previous quarters, now including the technology sector, the consumer sector, and also the healthcare uh, sector, the CEOs wants to open with the new demand, new tech, which is a very exciting thing for sure, because it's the progress with the most cutting edge research or most cutting edge strategy, right? So for example, um, Microsoft opened with Azure, a distributed computing fabric, rapid machine learning, hybrid computing, this and that, a lot of technique buzzwords. But this time they make a different choice. They don't open with a new product, rather they open with a product that focus on addressing and helping people's urgent need during an environment where people need to work remotely. So in this quarter, we noticed that um, the CEO opens with team, says that it's empowering people and organizations for a world of secure remote work and learning, brings together communications, collaborations, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if that is the case, if that is the case, then if we do, make a word account. For example, we see this pattern that people are talking more about their associates, um, their teams, their colleagues, the partners they work with. Then if we do a employee word list, we should observe a significant increase from the previous quarter and to the current quarter. And here in this um, graph, we show that from previous quarter to the current quarter for both uh, for all three sectors, technology sector, consumer stable sector, and healthcare sector, we all see a significant increase of the mentioning of employees in the earnings transcript, including the remark session and also the Q&A session. In addition to that, if we expand, right, if we expand to the outside of the organization, people not only think internally, they also think the stakeholders they have. So if we do a word count for the partners, users, developers, subscribers, consumers, we also see that across the board, especially for consumer stables and healthcare, there is a significant increase in the mentioning of the stakeholder related words. Okay. 
a very quick summary here is if we compare the previous quarter prepared remarks and current quarter prepared remarks, we see that previous quarter, people focus more on number, people focus more on the new technology, they focus on Q to Q comparison. But in current quarter, people show more gratitude, they talk more about the people, the urgent human needs, it's more forward looking with good faith. Okay, with that being said, let's move on to the next part. Um, I guess for now, I already start to see a lot of questions. We will be finished in 15 minutes, and after that, we will have a Q&A session. Okay, so the second part is CEO and CFO's disclosure strategy in the Q&A session. Now, let's start by looking at, if we say there's Q&A session, of course, we care about how many participants are there in the current quarter that is severely impacted by COVID-19. Now, we can see that Across these three sectors, there's not a really difference, not an increase in the number of participants. So the number of participants are the same. The number of participants are the same. However, the questions people ask, the tone they ask a question, and the answers that are given by the CEOs and the CFO are vastly different. And how exactly is that? In previous quarter, what we noticed is people focus on the current quarter. If this is what we are going to deliver current quarter, this is what we ask you to nail. In current quarter, people know that business are affected by the coronavirus, so a lot of questions are made um, towards the long horizon. For example, how to expect this accelerating over the next few years? Uh, what is the long-term implications for this? Uh, how do you balance the near-term objectives and the longer-term structure changes? Right, so that is one thing that we notice. But in addition to that, if you say that analysts ask about these questions, like is, um, are you seeing the end of this downturn? Is the recovery shape being a U shape or V shape or L shape? The CEOs and CFOs may not know. And they, they don't, we don't see that they pretend to know the answers when they don't have one. So they are being very truthful and very transparent. They don't give what is beyond their knowledge. They don't try to give people a fake assurance, right? So people, sometimes they say, I can just give a qualitative cover to what was said earlier. People would just be very honest and say, I would love to be able to tell you this answer to that question, but there really isn't it. So people are not pretending to know the answers. And in addition to that, we notice a very, um, a very noticeable strategy that are used by the CEOs and CFOs is they will use a strategy we call preempt strategy. So sometimes CEOs will know that there is a specific questions that analysts have a high probability of going to ask. So he will say, before turning to your questions, I want to address just two items I expect that are on your minds. First, about liquidity. Second, about recession. A lot of companies, including Coca-Cola, they just hold off for providing guidance. And they say that, I expect to come back to our second quarter in July with greater clarity. So this, we call this uh, preempt strategy. Another very interesting uh, pattern that we notice is the focus on promotion versus the focus on prevention in these Q&A session. What exactly am I talking about? So here you're seeing a table, including two columns. On the left-hand side, you're seeing a list of questions that are made toward a promotion focus. On the right hand side, you are seeing a column that's made toward the prevention focus. So if I give you a question and ask you about the hopes, accomplishments, and advancements needs, how do you plan to grow new customers? How do you plan to um, expand to new market? How do you expect to find a new attractive market and the next um, very highlight of your company uh, profit? That is a promotion focus. Now, if I ask you, how do you make sure there's no problem of your supply chain? How do you make sure that uh, there's no problem with your capacity? How do you make sure that the customers are uh, being stable? There's predictability of your um, sales and your break even. What is your competitive threat? Is your market um, is your market grabbed by someone else? Those are questions with prevention focus. 
Now, it is not surprising that when analysts are asking a questions that's oriented from the promotion perspective, you would give an answer with a promotion aspect, right? So for example, uh, when Case uh, Weiss from Morgan Stanley is asking how much of that you are able to actually take into revenues or monetize. Now, uh, Santa Nadella from Microsoft. So the, um, the, the perspective that he take is the approach we take is really to be there for our customers at their time of the most acute need. For, so this um, little transaction, uh, this little interaction you can see here is definitely from promotion queue to a promotion answer. More interestingly, even when the questions are asked with a, promo, uh, with a prevention focus, the uh, CEOs and CFOs are very um, smart in using strategy of changing it to a promotion aspect when answering these questions. For example, here when Mark Mo Adler from Bernstein Research is asking a question, we understand there are supply chain issues that has been affecting your deliveries and there's disruptions in the labor market. This is definitely a prevention focused question. But again, the um, CEO answers the questions with a promotion focus saying that, well, our company was held well. We do have a data center and a food brain that really supports our customers' needs for both the elasticity of demand they need, but also compliance. We feel well positioned for them. So they change and shift this from prevention question to a promotion focus. And this is a very, very important strategy they use for the reason that the power of promotion focus not only applies to the current question, but it also helps shape the later atmosphere in this whole earnings conference call. This is an example from another company where at the end of the prepared remarks, the CFO talk about there is key expense lines, the biggest driver of expense growth, credit deterioration seems to be a lot of negative framing there. And let's see what happens next. Analyst question one about expense. Analyst question two, still about expense. Maybe taking the question on expense a little bit further. Analyst question three, still about expense related to credit deterioration. Now, the, um, the spirit of this um, conversation changed to upbeat again after the following remark, when the CEO says, we take a long-term view though. The good thing about, we have a clear sense, it's memorable, the recovery is also fast when it comes back. So the power of promotion focus is definitely a very important strategy that people use. So what is a quick summary here? In the previous quarter, the Q&A content usually focuses on one product or one item. People expect the CEO and CFO of the company to deliver on the current quarter and focus emphasizing only on the current quarter. In the current quarter, uh, that is severely affected by coronavirus, if we look at the Q&A content, we see that the questions are broader in scope. We see that the questions are longer term oriented. In the previous quarter, both analysts and CEOs and CFOs, they like to mention the tech buzzwords, 5G, augmented reality, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning. They like to mention the new deals, the capital market opportunities, the M&A opportunities, the exciting targets they are going to purchase. But in this period, the Q&A contents focus more on how we work, what we need when we have the remote work needs and remote learning needs. So that is a quick summary for the content of the Q&A session. Now, in terms of the Q&A style, now for previous quarters, we see more matter of a fact questions. We, we see a neutral tone and more focus of focusing on the promotion focus. But in current period, the Q&A style definitely shifts to um, a lot of questions starts with casting, seemingly a casting with the executives, but then having a neutral tone or even a prevention focus. We do notice that each round of Q&A gets significant longer and we see that the attitudes of the CEOs and CFOs when taking these questions is that they shift from a prevention focus to a promotion focus. Okay, so uh, with that being said, those are the two sessions for um, the um, a typical earnings conference call structure. What is the takeaway from today's webinar? If we think about how the CEOs and CFOs talk about the impact of the coronavirus 19, 
in terms of the content, which is the substance of the message that are being delivered. In previous quarter, people focus on numbers, profit, the past, and the comparison. In current quarter, the CEOs and CFOs focus more on the use of words. They realize the use of words is very important. Focus more on showing gratitude to people, having good faith, and forward looking for the future and taking this as a learning opportunity rather than competition or comparison. In terms of the style, which is even more interesting and very significantly affecting the tone and also the atmosphere of an earnings conference call, we see that the framing and the way to deliver the message changes. Although the length of the text is almost a hold as constant, the tone of the words changes from more use of uncertain um, changes to the more use of uncertainty words. And when it uh, takes to the prevention versus promotion focus, CEOs and CFOs, they would shift the questions from the negative tone with a prevention focus to a more neutral tone with a promotion focus. Now, the method that we use in this, um, in this talk, um, we call it a textual analysis. So what is a textual analysis? Textual analysis is a method that researchers use to describe and interpret the characteristics of a recorded or a visual message. So te textual analysis has a lot of limits too. For example, reading social cues isn't always one of them. Now, in addition to that, I do want to share these company transcripts. They may have typos, sometimes very, very important typos. For example, one thing that I noticed when um, PNG CEO is talking about shave, as in a gro uh, grooming product, it is uh, misspelled as share. So instead of hearing that our product help you to shave your face, um, the transcript reads, our product helps you to share your face. So these type of examples show that the textual analysis, before you want to do a detailed analysis, please make sure that your transcript looks well and does reflect the original content and spirit of what people really say. So here I show a picture of a beach and its sand, right? Sometimes people say the best way to understand a beach property is to understand the property of each sand, right? So in a text, if you want to understand a big chunk or even hundreds, a big batch of hundreds of thousands of texts, looking at each sand is beyond our brain's capability, but by using the textual analysis, we can better appreciate the message that's being delivered in these texts. How to apply this in your business? Maybe you're interested in monitoring all the web posts about your company, no matter where they come from, in a different time zone, in a different geographic area. You want to monitor tone and sentiment, and thus maybe you're interested in doing the textual analysis. Perhaps you are interested in checking your own language style for a public speech or a sales speech. Now, if you record your Zoom meeting and using the Google Translate, um, uh, transcript, transcript, you can easily convert a video or an audio into a transcript. And you can also check your own language style to see whether you are reflecting what you truly want to deliver to your audience, depending on the context. Perhaps you are interested in using textual analysis because this can add to your tools in monitoring your stock portfolio by monitoring the tone and the style and the sentiment of the CEO and the CFO disclosure in your own stock portfolio, right? We tend to be unaware of our own style before we give a quantitative analysis of what we actually say, right? For example, I may do an analysis of my own speech afterwards to see how many typos I have there, how many quantifiers I have there, and how many things I shouldn't have said, but I said in this speech. So um, just to end um, my talk here and to um, start the today's Q&A session. Again, I'm very appreciative of you joining me here. Um, I'm just super impressed and amazed by what technology can do today to uh, keep, keep people connected so that we can have a nice intellectual exchange while not bounded by the geographic region, right? And as I mentioned earlier, I, I do feel that the most precious gift we can give to one another is your time and also your undivided attention. 
So I do appreciate this chance and I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity to share what I just learned in the last month. This has been a fun project for me to keep me from being insane in the coronavirus period. Uh, that is to look at the disclosure strategy of CEOs and CFOs. And what I learned is that people are keeping good faith. We all have good confidence that at the other end of this tunnel, we are going to emerge even stronger. Science have the power of fighting against this coronavirus. And more importantly, in the difficult time, we learn to better appreciate the people that we work with, uh, the people that are around us, and we never take it granted what is happening around us. So um, with that being said, I'd like to turn the floor to Amanda for giving me the questions. Excuse me. Uh, wonderful, Faye. Thank you so much uh, for you. that talk and for sharing about your research in this space and the work that you've been doing. Uh, lots of great questions in the q and I'm trying to sort through to bring ones that are particularly relevant to, um, to what you've spoken about. I do yeah. want to encourage all of the participants out there to upvote questions uh, yes. that, that they want to have answered so that we can follow those. But I'm going to start here with a question about historical precedents. Uh, curious in your research and the, the work that you've done recently with uh, the financial statements, if you are quarterly statements, if um, there are other historical precedents for the research that you've been doing uh, or other instances where we've seen similar reactions in these quarterly statements, um, and if you can share a bit with the audience about that. Thank you, Amanda. I appreciate that question. I think that is a great question. And um, if we want to do a pre-post comparison, right, the best way of doing that is to establish another alternative benchmark to talk about another disaster. For example, what happened after the Katrina hurricane? How do people talk about the impact of, uh, not coronavirus, the impact of the hurricane on their corporate profits? And also sometimes people may say, what about the financial crisis? Now for the stock market crash down, um, the systematic risk that we cannot have, how does that affect the disclosure strategy of the CEOs and the CFOs? And Amanda, I wish I have a question, I have an answer to that, um, but that is definitely on my to-do list actually. I don't have a good answer for it. I do plan to compare and take a look and see in other historical disaster events like political turmoil for some countries, like um, the natural disaster for some countries, like financial crisis for some countries. How do people use a disclosure strategy? And does it differ across the context? Maybe, for example, if it um, comes from an event that is more um, less intervened with human efforts, we are more likely to show gratitude and talk about how this is uncertainty out of our hands. But for example, like a financial crisis, maybe people feel that um, it's the compensation um, going wrong, it is the incentive structure going on, and maybe the disclosure strategy of CEOs and CFOs are different. So honestly, I do appreciate this great question. It gives me a great suggestion for what I should do next, but I don't, I don't know the answer to it. So thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. So lots of questions in the chat around the impact of the coronavirus and this current pandemic on specific industries. I know you talked a bit across industries related to the financial um, statements and quarterly statements, but are there any trends that you're seeing um, industry specific that might help uh, you might inform your insights around which industries might recover more quickly or uh, who's being harder hit, these types of things to help uh, maybe address the, the idea around industry trend, trends and impacts in this time. That is a great question, Amanda. So what kind of industries are going to emerge from this faster? Or if we may even twist this question a little bit, that is, some firms are even seeing more of a tailwind instead of a hell, uh, instead of a headwind during the coronavirus. And I would say that for healthcare, actually the three sectors that I pick, the healthcare, the consumer staples, and also for technology sector, 
those are the sectors where we see, although their gross margins are negatively affected across the board. However, we do see that there is increase in the subscriptions for these at-home technology service. For healthcare, for example, we see that patients are no longer being able to go to doctor's offices. And we see that representatives from these uh, pharmaceutical companies cannot go to doctor's offices to convince that they buy their products. However, this may affect different companies differentially, even in the same industry. Why do we say that, right? So for example, if a company, healthcare company, it focuses on injections and focuses on therapies that have to be uh, administered by a nurse or by a doctor, then for sure this is going to be negatively affected the most because people cannot stay at home and use that specific type of medicine. On the other hand, for um, if, if the medicine is a oral medication, it can be sent and can be fulfilled based on online order, can be delivered to um, patients home directly, then we are actually seeing an increase for these healthcare companies top line for the reason that it's not affected because customers' preferences, they shift toward a specific way of buying that can be delivered to their home, that they can use more easily at their home. And even when they are doing this remotely, they can still enjoy the service. So those are the industries that we see will recover the fastest. And a profound change, I would say, is um, there seems to be no going back once things and data are on the cloud, once people become collaborative on the team, it is hard to go back. So for these trends that we're seeing in technology, um, the subscriptions and telemedication and remote learning, these are just a general trend that will last even after coronavirus recovers. Thank you, Faye. That's really helpful and insightful for you to share, um, and I'm sure valuable to today's audience. Um, maybe switching gears a bit to be forward-looking. Yeah. Um, any forecast or thoughts um, that your research might project, or that the 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 work that you've done uh, might project around um, what what we should. Um, how we should recover after the pandemic ends or how CFOs and CEOs language might change or, um, you know, help to influence um, the, the, uh, the post-pandemic era. Mm. I'm still trying to appreciate the flavor of this question. It's definitely a very deep and philosophical question. So can I, can I paraphrase this? Um, so it's like almost a question is asking, the words is not only a reflection of what's happening, but also what people say becomes a shaper or influence people's beliefs and may affect what we will do in the next quarter. Is that kind of the flavor and spirit of this question? Yes, I think so. Really, um, you know, a couple of different questions in here, trying to tie them together a bit. So yeah. Some, um, some feedback from you, but um, yeah, absolutely. Around kind of the forward, forward looking, and and how um, how what we can expect next, or or how um, organizations should think about kind of the the outcomes or the the next steps in recovering from this pandemic. Yeah, that that is a great question. I guess it's hard to answer this question from a very high level perspective for the reason that. Um, it is hard to like summarize what is going on. I can give some detailed examples of what I see in this transcript. Now, um, for example, if you take a look at these detailed uh, disclosure strategies, for example, from Microsoft and for example, from Google, they are all saying that what they are offering is a platform type of product. So maybe before the pandemic, the, um, the platform that they use um, can be sold to the customers individually and separately. But now they are saying that one of their biggest advantage is that they can offer this platform and infrastructure as a whole so that customers can take advantage of one of the products and quickly leverage that one product and take advantage of the benefits of another product. For example, Microsoft the team, right? We are all remote. Uh, we are all doing remotely 
working and study from home, um, no matter you want to do it or you don't want to do it, no matter you're a social person or introverted person, we, we just all have to do that. And Microsoft team actually did not have that good of growth in previous quarters, but in the current quarter, it sees double digit growth. And Microsoft is saying that for a lot of times, it would be hard to sell to new customers, but for customers who already use other Microsoft products, it would be very easy for them to adapt a new product, which is this team, um, and use that on top of all the products they are already using. So that would be uh, one example. Uh, another example that I noticed, um, for example, healthcare industry, the, um, a lot of the CEOs and CFOs um, in healthcare uh, industry are being asked, when is the test, when is the vaccine um, are going to be there and how are you going to ensure the capacity that you are delivering these products that customers need. Now, if you think about this, it's definitely not an easy job for these healthcare company. On one hand, they have to figure out when this animal testing can be moved to human testing and when is a good time to deliver the results, not to give people fake assurance. On the other hand, you also need the, um, you also need the uh, collaboration from the FDNA to give your approval for manufacturing this product. So what we see in a lot of these closures, people actually see, we are manufacturing this at a risk. So they are holding a good faith that at the end of the day, it will work and um, they may gain the success. And so that the, um, uh, the good faith that they are keeping there is they already get the internal processes, the people, the talent, and also the factory ready so that whenever that vaccine is, is something, is something that proves to be effective and approved by the FDA, it could be immediately put into manufacturing process and production. I, I actually don't know whether that answers the question, but I'm just <laughs> trying my best. It's, um, but I appreciate that. Well, I, um, I appreciate that question, yeah. Absolutely, Faye. We, we appreciate um, your responses and, and thoughtfulness in, um, in responding. I'm gonna go ahead and pose the last question to you before we wrap up which is around um, specifically the industries that you looked at. I know you've looked at technology, consumer product, and healthcare industry. Exactly. Uh, a couple of questions from participants today around other industries. And oh. uh, if you have any insights there, obviously not specifically within your research, mm -hmm. um, but if you could make comments on any other industries that um, maybe you considered or, or why the research focused where it did, um, would be insightful for today's audience. Definitely, definitely, Amanda. Appreciate that question. So, um, first, no, personally, why did I pick these three um, industries? For sure, it has something to do with my own stock portfolio and uh, the, the 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 industries that I'm more familiar with and have more experience with. Uh, but we are we are we're definitely seeing different trends um, for the coronavirus for different industries. For example, energy sector and the utility sector, right? With this huge volatility in the commodity prices, um, which is definitely out of control at a company level, you can imagine this causes a lot of change for people. Um, if you are thinking about the industry for like um, cosmetic products, skincare products, um, the luxury products, there is, shrinking in consumer demand and we don't know when it's going to come back so that's another just some trend that i see when i take a look of these companies disclosures the reason why i focus on these um uh, the reason why i focus on these three industries is just purely because of my um preference and my own experience and i look forward to uh, working more with the other um, part of the um, industries to see what are the trend there. Yes. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Du, so much for your time today. I know that you have some materials we're going to share with yes. attendees yes. from today's yes. session in follow-up, yeah. and yeah. our attendees can expect to receive those in the Definitely. next days alongside yeah. a recording yeah. of this presentation. Furthermore, uh, your questions that we didn't get to in this chat, they will be answering some of those in text, and we'll be sending those out via email. So we look forward to continuing this conversation with 
all of our participants. And again, want to thank you, Professor Du, for your time. Really appreciate all of your insights today. Um, and thanks to all of our participants for attending as well. As we wrap up, we do want to gather interest via a poll from our participants. So we'll go ahead and post that so individuals can respond to the poll. Um, and uh, we, you know, again, we hope you gain some valuable knowledge. We hope you'll join us for our next webinar, which is next Tuesday, June 9th at 2 p.m. Central Time. Professors Robert Brunner and uh, David Nickel will present cyber threats in the age of COVID-19. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all then and uh, just wish you all the best. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you all and stay healthy, stay safe.